Coming up on American Medicine Today, medical universities have turned to politics in lieu of medicine and students are graduating woefully unqualified. Kenny Shu tells us how the diversity, equity and inclusion inventory are attacking your quality of care. Then, Wendy began suffering from spinal stenosis, causing her incredible pain. Not wanting to endure another failed fusion, she found the Bonatti Spine Institute and is happy to get back to her active lifestyle pain-free. Finally, returning guest retired U.S. Air Force Colonel Jim Warshuk joins us to discuss current topics including Chinese spy balloons and toxic train derailments. Find out where he thinks these issues may lead us in the next big election. Coming up on American Medicine Today. Featuring cutting edge science and medical innovation, touching personal stories of recovery from pain, along with political, social and healthcare issues plaguing our nation. This is American Medicine Today, brought to you by the Bonatti Spine Institute and Alfred Bonatti, MD. Welcome to American Medicine Today. I'm Kimberly Bromel Bonatti alongside Ethan Euchre and world-renowned orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Alfred Bonatti. Now it seems we're facing a cultural revolution in healthcare and many experts are concerned that by focusing on anti-racism and indoctrination rather than teaching actual medicine, students are graduating woefully unqualified to join the workforce. Now joining us to discuss is Kenny Shu, president of Colorus United and author of An Inconvenient Minority, The Attack on Asian American Excellence and the Fight for Meritocracy. Thank you for joining us, Kenny. And thank you for having me. Now, the latest evidence of lowering standards comes from UNC School of Medicine. Tell us what that curriculum is all about. So the UNC School of Medicine released a framework called the Task Force to Integrate Social Justice into the Curriculum. Uh, By the way, the UNC School of Medicine, the CEO of that, is also the CEO of the entire $5.8 billion health system in North Carolina. And so this task force has decided that, one, it wants to affirmatively hire so-called diverse doctors, uh, even with lower qualifications. It also says that we need to start teaching the structural components of racism and health uh, to every doctor uh, who comes through our medical school. And so this means that North Carolina is going to get increasingly woke doctors who don't know how to treat Mm -hmm. a a patient's medical condition, but sure as heck know how to treat a student or a patient's racism. Because we know that's what we seek out doctors for. That's so important. Yeah. Right, exactly. And this is already having negative effects on North Carolina. For example, in 2022, UNC Chapel Hill's health system was investigated by the federal government for blatant patient jeopardy, putting patients in immediate jeopardy. That's what they called it. Uh, Concerns included uh, quality control, infection control, and patients' rights. And that was the entire UNC health system. So at a time when UNC health is already struggling and increasing mortality rates, increasing hospital stays, increasing medical mistakes. They are focused on admitting a doctor based on race rather than the most competent, most qualified, most excellent doctor. Do you think that's a push towards socialist medicine, healthcare providers, and and you're taking the, the MDs and you're bringing them to the same level as maybe a, a nurse assistant or nurse practitioner? It, it is. It is. And let me give you an example. Heart surgery is the profession that requires the most competent doctor possible because any marginal decline of quality of a heart surgeon leads to hundreds of more deaths per year. Why? Because one heart surgeon, and there are only about 500 heart surgeons in the entire United States. So these are the elite of the elite. One heart surgeon is responsible for about three, you know, 100 to 300 heart surgeries every year. And if your mortality rate is above one or two percent, your entire department gets shut down because of blatant uh, medical malpractice. And so these have to be the most competent doctors possible. And yet UNC is offering um, new fellowships only to black applicants. Black applicants, only black applicants are going to get access to these new scholarships and fellowships to train them in essential things like brain surgery, heart surgery, those kinds of things. And this is not choosing from the widest possible pool of the best doctors. This is only choosing from a subset of them. 
this will lead to lower quality medicine. I love how the, the in in an effort to attack racism, they're using reverse racism. So <laughs> exactly. you know, it's just mind boggling. Um, and I believe it's called uh, holistic admissions mm. that they use. Tell me what that is. What does that even mean? It sounds so pretty. <laughs> Little so on top. Holistic admissions. What this, I'll tell you how they call it. So they say we evaluate applicants based on a range of factors, not just their test scores and their grades. But this is what it means in practice. UNC and other medical schools across the nation have already gotten rid of requirements to test a certain score on the MCAT and on the step one board exam, which determines your entrance into residency. And um, they have made these test tests pass fail. Why? because they are concerned that these tests don't admit a sufficient diversity of applicants. What they mean, of course, is black applicants mm -hmm. uh, and Hispanic applicants, because they sure as heck admit a lot of Asian applicants. Asians are scoring really great on these scores. And these are, these are very, these are standardized tests. Anyone knows how to study for them and they directly translate to your performance on medical boards, which leads to your performance as a doctor. So they they are lowering standards uh, to achieve a certain racial balance in their group because they're concerned about color, not merit. We need a private school that is totally independent and is rich enough that these things cannot happen. The community has enough money in North Carolina to create a fantastic medical school that is private and only admit the people who is capable. I don't give a damn if it is black, green, or whatever. But yes, needs to have the brains to treat my family. Okay. That's exactly right. And actually, uh, we started my organization, Colorist United. We fight for meritocratic standards in a race blind society. We started a petition targeting the UNC School of Medicine. We're, talk we're targeting the CEO of the health system, Dean Wesley Burks, to denounce DEI, to denounce diversity, equity, and inclusion, and pledge only the most excellent standards and transparency in their outcomes. That's another thing that they haven't done. Patients deserve to know what their mortality rate is in surgeries, right. what their uh, length of stay rate is. Is it standardized? Is it better than the nation? They have the right to know that. So if you go to coloristunited.org, and by the way, you do not have to be a North Carolina resident because we're speaking for medical schools across the country. We are targeting one medical school, but we believe we can convince them through the power of tens of thousands of signatures. Go to coloristunited.org. Go to our UNC medicine petition and sign it. Fight for better standards for you and your children. Really, we don't do any marketing in medicine. And the marketing in medicine is just to try to show that the people that is being treated is treated properly and the results are acceptable to be able to continue practicing in that specialty or whatever the, the medical treatments are. We allowed pharma to just shove medications to us and the internal medical doctor use those medications right and left without even knowing the side effects. You know, I, that's a great, that's a great idea. And uh, that's what we at Colorist United are doing on a nonprofit angle here. We are showing uh, the lowering of standards and how they are lowering outcomes in the medical community. But let me give you an example. UNC Health is such a brand name. People and they own so much of North Carolina doctors that if you're a private clinic and you have better outcomes, you still have to compete with the brand and influence of UNC Health, meaning that you need to sell yourself as, well, we actually have better outcomes. So people in North Carolina are unwittingly possibly going to a lower quality provider because they have the UNC or Duke Health brand instead of a better private practice provider. Wow. And that's because of marketing. Well, thank you so much, Kenny Shu, for being on the program to discuss something so incredibly important. We don't need the indoctrination of doctors. So they're providing anti-racism to their clientele instead of the patient's health and medical treatment being uh, first and foremost. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good seeing you guys. Make sure you stay tuned. Coming up after the break, a story of recovery. World-renowned Dr. Bonatti created the Bonatti Spine Procedures to minimize surgery scarring and recovery. 75,000 procedures have resulted in 98.75% satisfaction. Over half our patients suffer from failed surgeries at other facilities. Visit AskBonatti.com. 
My name is Wendy Balich, and I live in Costa Rica right now. I sold my business about seven years ago. Now I travel, and I do a lot of volunteer work. Um, I'm in Thailand a lot, Cambodia, and then I do a lot of turtle sanctuaries in Costa Rica. And so it's a lot of heavy lifting and things like that. My pain came up over time. Pain uh, was, you know, at first was little by little. Um, I used to be a runner. I used to um, do serious weight training, squats, lunges, training, and was very into my body and health. And then slowly I was able to do less and less and less. And to the point where before I came here, I could barely bend over and tie my shoes. Like I said, doing a lot of volunteer work, it's just more and more pain, more and more pain. And then like vibrating pains down the backs of my legs. I couldn't even stand up in an upright position because of the pulling on the back of my legs and through my um, buttocks and my lower back. It felt like it was like a really tight tight spring, and I could not stand upright. As her pain continued to develop, she tried conservative treatments. When I was still in the States here, obviously I went to the chiropractor, got x-rays, so I tried that route, epidurals and, you know, whatever, over-the-counter pain meds I could stick into my stomach without being sick, and doing less and less. I wasn't able to run anymore. I was not able to lift things anymore. And then I was just, now the doctor's like, now you can walk. And I'm like, I'm too energetic and young to just walk. And then the pain really started getting bad because I quit doing the epidurals because I was in Costa Rica and I also wanted to be at that maximum pain level before I came here. And when that, when I realized what my body's real pain level was at when I was doing nothing, I realized that I needed to do something. I was doing damage to my body. I was starting to feel tingling in my toes. I said, it's time And before I lost permanent, you know, nerve damage. Desperate for help, she went to a neurologist where they diagnosed her with spinal stenosis and recommended a spinal fusion in her lower back. Having already suffered a valve fusion in her neck, Wendy put off having surgery. And then when I finally saw a neurologist, I went and uh, they did MRIs and they said, my first problem was like in my arm and in my neck. So I went ahead and got the surgery on my neck and uh, was not, not loving that recovery process. It was very hard recovery, and I actually still have some nerve damage in this left arm. And so when it came time to do my lower spine, I just kept putting it off and putting it off. My neurologist in North Carolina definitely suggested to do the lower lumbar spinal fusion, and I kept reading into it, and then I looked at the recovery process, and I also talked to many people, and I just talked about that recovery time and the prognosis of most people that get that surgery is not good. Um, when they said that they wanted to do the fusion again, I just had heard so many more you know, horror stories and again, the recovery period and wearing the brace and not being able to do anything again. My neurologist said even after the fusion, I will still never be able to do the things that I want to do. I should still never lift weights or you know, do yoga, not even yoga. Forget about running, you know. I drive an ATV. I'm always, you know, I just want to be out there and be doing things. I retired early. I want to go do stuff. And so I was not willing to take the risk after the fusion on my neck. It was miserable. A friend told Wendy about the Bonatti Spine Institute, and she decided to make a call to see if they could help. I was in building my home in Costa Rica, and my uh, architect, who happens to be from Texas, who's also living in Costa Rica, she said, have you heard about this Bonatti guy? Because I told her I was considering the fusion again, and she would see me in such pain, and I was always complaining. And so I just got online, and I called, and I sent my MRIs, and they were very swift and very informative on the phone even. And the MRIs got shipped here, and they called me right away and said I was a good candidate. Upon hearing she was a good candidate for the exclusive outpatient Bonatti spine procedures, where no hardware is ever used, she made an appointment. Even the first day I came here from my consultation was the same day I had my surgery. I flew in, they signed me in, they did my consultation, took me in, did another MRI, did my blood work, and I was in surgery in that afternoon. That's the beauty of it, because, you know, any other place, it's months, you know, you get 
a month to see a doctor, and then you have to go over here and get MRIs, and you have to go over here and get a you know another you know measurement for a brace, or you have to go and get uh, an X-ray from a different place, and then you have to see the doctor again, and then you have to stay in the hospital for at least three nights, and takes a whole day to get out of the hospital, and then you're in you know you're laying flat. They're telling you you're doing nothing for at least six to eight weeks. I loved it because everything was right here. I mean, it was bam, 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 bam. Um, I just walked over there, no waiting, MRI, nice big machine. Last MRI I had, I was probably like, it looks like it was an antique. Felt like it was an antique. Seemed like way more x-rays and way more positions and way more you know, technical than I've ever had before as far as the x-rays for sure. Dr. Keither um, came in and he was the first um, surgeon to ever show me that I actually have a fine um, line fracture on both sides of that vertebrae that was done years ago and then of course as we get older we form arthritis in there and you get all that um, scar tissue in there and he says and that's what we need to go in and clean out. Like many, Wendy was nervous about being awake for her procedures but soon realized that the surgical staff at the Bonatti Spine Institute are committed to keeping patients calm and comfortable throughout the entire process. After talking to the anesthesiologist which was very very he was very thorough. I remember talking a little bit um, talking to um, the surgeon and telling him, you know, like, I feel it in my leg, I feel it in my back. But I mean, no pain. I had no pain at all and very little recollection on my first surgery. And the second surgery, I kind of remember a lot more, but yeah, it was fine. There was no pain at all. Yep, any pain up here? Nope. Hamstring? Nope. Side? Nope. When she stood up in the recovery room for the first time, she knew right away her pain was gone. As soon as I got up off the table and started walking, and I remember that too because I kind of went down and did a little model turn, pretending I was on the runway because it really felt good. Next day, still the same thing, still felt great. The next morning, I was excited to get back in here and get the other side done so I could just get it done and be happy and go on my merry way. Having already experienced the recovery process after a fusion surgery at a different facility, Wendy was amazed at the difference of the Bonatti spine procedures. It was miserable. Um, the first time, I immediately um, told my husband, I'm like, go out and buy me a recliner because there's no way I'm going to be able to sleep for the next eight weeks. I couldn't even, I couldn't do anything. Like, I couldn't, like the recovery was just brutal. At Bonatti, I just went I took an Uber back to my hotel. I ordered Uber Eats, um, watched a movie, and enjoyed my evening. It was back here at 8.15 with a smile on my face. At the Bonatti Spine Institute, patients are not required to wear uncomfortable braces or go through weeks of physical therapy. Instead, they are told to walk about an hour each day. They said to walk, try to get his, you know, walk a little bit, walk a little bit more, and, um, Tomorrow, they said to start trying to walk at least an hour a day. Wendy recommends anyone suffering with neck or back pain to contact the Bonatti Spine Institute. If you're debating on whether you should get this surgery, whether it's monetary, whether it's time, well, if it's time, this is the place. But you just can't put a price on your quality of life. Now out of pain, Wendy is looking forward to traveling and enjoying her active lifestyle. Like I'm already getting online and getting ready to book my next trip and I don't even really have to spend that extra money for that laying down bed. I can actually maybe get a business class and sit up right now this time. I think everybody was shocked, like, really, you had surgery today? I had a drain tube. I was at my desk doing payroll for 200 employees, worked till night. Got up, went to bed. This is the honest to God truth. And was recovering, I didn't feel anything. The pain that I was suffering is gone. First time I came in here was Monday, and today is Thursday. I've had two surgeries and am doing fantastic. I'm still in shock that I can walk. That's all within four days. Benati succeeds where others fail. Welcome to American Medicine Today. So with so much going on in the news from Chinese spy balloons to train derailments to the border crisis, 
to Biden document scandals, we thought we'd invite our friend, retired U.S. Air Force Colonel Jim Warshuk, to join us right here in studio for a discussion. He's also former chairman of the Hillsborough County Florida Republican Party and former White House National Security Council staffer. Thank you yet again for joining us in studio. Absolutely. <laughs> There's so much to get to. How about all these train derailments? What in the world is going on? Yeah, it's interesting, you know, particularly where you've seen about four in the last several weeks. Yes. Uh, and I think most of them, as we've seen, are carrying hard uh, hazardous cargo. They're causing problems, particularly for people in the in the, in the surrounding towns and certainly uh, nature and wildlife. Normally, the, the typical thing you, you see is, you know, the first response is, you know, pallets and pallets of water and blankets and certainly the water is the critical thing mm -hmm. because people are questioning whether their water is safe to drink. People like throwing pebbles into the creeks and all of this slick comes up to the uh. top. These are American citizens mm -hmm. who, again, didn't ask for this. It just happened. So go help them. What is that area politically? Are they more conservative? At um, East Palestine, Ohio, 72% of the population there voted for Donald Trump. Isn't that interesting? Mm. Very interesting. And the government does nothing except tell people, you know, they should stay home. And the other side of the coin is most of the mainstream media isn't covering it either. So the word is not getting out around the country. Hmm. Um, and we're dependent on news outlets and, and um, you know, media uh, like like this to get to get the word out. Where's uh, our, our little friend Greta? On all of this, yes, I, I, I saw I saw someone standing up in front of a East Palestine, Ohio sign this morning. Hold up a sign that says "Where's Greta?" Where's Greta? <laughs> uh, and that's that's a big thing. Where where are the environmentalists? Who they need John to call it climate change. That's that's right. my response, to everyone. Where are they? You haven't said the trigger word, right. climate change. I want to touch upon shift gears a little bit and touch upon these Chinese. Uh, and oh, now they're saying balloons. that a lot of them they don't even know if it came from China. Some are calling them UFOs. Then you got Biden sort of, well, first off, he didn't talk about it at all for quite some time. And then he came out and said, well, it's because we ratcheted up our radar. And I'm sure you know, as a, as a former uh, retired Air Force colonel, is that true? Is that something they can do is, is make them more sensitive? So now you can see these smaller balloons that apparently they weren't seeing before. And the first balloon that was shot down in the Atlantic, we watched that balloon take off from Hunan Island, China on the 20th of January. They didn't put that information out and we detected it on 27 January coming towards the Aleutians. That was the opportunity to what we'd call identify friend or foe and make a determination whether this should be uh, addressed. What is your opinion on that? No, it came from China and it had a very sophisticated telemetry package on it on the gondola underneath and it was steerable. You know, some people are trying to make the excuse that it just drifted off course, not was steerable, particularly when it got to Montana and was able to stay over Montana for several days and look at a number of different military sites. So they were able to maneuver it over various sites. So it got to collect all of our military data and then he waits even longer and then decides to take it out. Why? My, my theory on that is, you know, and we know the Biden relationship with China was, we don't want to anger the Chinese anymore. I'm going to let it drift over uh, just inside the 12 mile limit where we can shoot it down and shoot it down knowing that the chances of recovering, not the balloon itself, we don't care about the balloon, but the, but the equipment on it mm -hmm. would sink and then get carried out to sea by the undertow and the current. And that seems to be what happened because they have not recovered really anything other than the balloon itself. And were these things commonplace when President Trump was in the White House? You know, there's always been balloons, but we've never had a situation like this. I think Trump would have been out there saying, right. you know, shaking his finger at, at, at Xi saying, why are you doing this? Right. Uh, and he would warn them in advance, I'm going to take it down before it reaches America. If the, gov the, the government would be right now, Donald Trump, and if he did allow this thing to happen, the Democrats will be talking about treason all over and will be all over the news 
that they will be accusing him that is allowing China to really research all our facilities. Part of what's going on here is they don't want to draw attention to anything that they uh, failed to handle in the in the proper way. You know, when you look at what's going on, you know, we just talked about the uh, the Ohio chemical thing and no real response from the White House. We had the Biden documents that showed up in, you know, four different parts of the country, and they're trying to push that aside. And so they're looking for lots of ways to distract us. That's what they're going to do because the situation economically is first and foremost the, the most difficult. And then we have, you know, so many different international events going on that, that they have to deal with. So they don't want to talk about it because they really don't have a message to tell the American people what's going on other than it's all bad. Well, it's part of the agenda of the the socialistic uh, behavior is destroy the destroy the economy, uh, indoctrinate the people, and uh, try to create a system where we can control population. Absolutely. And the control population is coming here in different ways. This mm -hmm. thing, the COVID, COVID is nothing more Absolutely. than the control population. Absolutely. They're creating in the men a sterility. In the women, they're going to create problems with the, with the, with the periods, and then suddenly we'll have a sterility in women. Mm -hmm. So it's controlled population. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you think, whether it's against China, Russia, China and Russia, uh, are we headed towards World War III? There is a new pack, if you will, being <laughs> formed between China, Iran, Russia, and some of the other Arab countries that are being pushed into uh, China's camp, thanks to the policies of the Biden regime. Mm -hmm. And that certainly is not where we want to be, particularly with China and Russia on the same side. Touching on the balloon, certainly the biggest concern I have is if they use this uh, and they use smaller ones that may be not be able to be detected, uh, that would have uh, electromagnetic pulse mm -hmm. package on it and they could what we call surgically target certain parts of the country. 2024 elections. Donald Trump still leads the board? Latest indicators are yes. Okay. And do you think <laughs> that he is he's going to end up winning? We can only hope. <laughs> All right. There well, you go. we'll Very end it on that big, strong like note. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for sharing your day with us. Retired U.S. Air Force Colonel Jim Warshuk. Thank you so much for watching. We'll be back next Saturday, 4 p.m. Eastern. If you've missed an episode, go over to our YouTube channel and search American Medicine Today. If you have any comments or questions, contact us at the number below. You can tweet at Dr. Benatti using hashtag American Medicine Today or hashtag AMT. We would like to hear from you.